Sci-fi reality is a concept where science fiction movies, stories, books, um, the contents in these motivate other people to build sci-fi reality, you know, um, I grew up in the 80s, I grew up in the 1980s as a kid, so I got to see technology really grow from its infancy. I remember watching movies like Back to the Future Part 2. They would be displaying fictitious future of, like, I believe it was 19 or 2015. That's that's um, what they were trying to display. But uh, there would be flying cars and technology that, that we never believed would actually come true. Because we didn't have any of that technology at that time. At the time Back to the Future 2 came out, video chatting like Skype and Zoom and, and uh, FaceTime, that didn't exist. It, it was science fiction. Uh, most of the public didn't have any of that. We only had corded telephones at the time. And, and to think that we're going to go from corded telephones to being able to see each other on the TV in real time and just talk to each other. Like, no one thought that was going to be real where you could just come home and do that. And there have been several examples like this in history where sci-fi that we see in movies and other forms of entertainment end up becoming reality for everyone in the physical world. Now, how this relates to my vision for the ultimate future of Nova Jade. The U.S. Army, they invest a lot of money in creating soldiers. From the time a person signs up and ships off to basic training, the government is making an investment into that person's flight ticket, the travel arrangements to get them to boot camp, the food to make sure they have energy to deal with what's going to happen when they get off that bus. Then the Army invests in a drill sergeants to train you day and night. Soldiers have already been in the Army for a while who they think are above their peers. They're going to invest to make them drill sergeants. And, and they're going to put you all together and basic training together. They invest in your physical training to make you a capable soldier who can keep going and complete missions. They invest in weeding people out who can't hack basic training, who don't really want to be in the army, who who who, who can't handle the physical training, they can't ha handle simulated combat missions, they can't handle shooting a rifle, can't handle uh, patching their buddies up if, if they're hurt. If you can't handle doing that, the army even invests to keep those people out and only keep humans who are highly adaptable and can move forward at free will, completing complex missions that, that most people are, are never going to be able to experience ever in their lives. Okay, then you might be asking yourself, is the army done investing into this soldier now? No, no, no they're not. That, that's, that, that's the bare minimum. This is a basic soldier at that time, the basic training. Okay, so after basic training, that soldier gets further investment from the United States government and go to advanced individual training, which when I was in, I don't know how it is now, when I was in, advanced individual training was like boot camp on steroids. Okay, you still had drill sergeants. They still did all, all the same stuff you learned in basic training, but they taught you more advanced skills. And you also got to learn about your MOS and your military occupational skills. So, so your technical skills. So like someone like me, I, I was at the time they called it a 67 uniform medium helicopter repair, which is very vague, very vague. It doesn't, it doesn't really tell you what you're getting into, but that, that was my skill. Now it's 15 uniform. So I had to go to advanced individual training for several more months than I went to basic training. So that's an even bigger investment. Okay, so let's dig further into this investment. This investment into the building and creating this one single soldier is not over. 
So once this soldier gets out of AIT, they're considered a basic soldier with their their basic technical skills that the army pay for their training. Okay? And and some of these skills you can only learn if you're in a military formal training environment. You can't go to like Walmart and expect them to have a department that, that gives these people training and no, no, no. You, there are some skills that you can only learn in the military and the government is investing. They're investing, they're making an investment in the people to complete this training to see who can do it, who wants to do it, who can stick with it and not get weeded out, who can who can adapt, who can build and learn and, and adapt to what we're trying to teach you and learn these new skills and go become a capable soldier. Okay? For this basic soldier who just got an AIT, this could be up to $150,000. Depending on what their job is, their special forces or advanced medics, add maybe another $200,000. Okay, I don't have the exact numbers. It's a lot more money, okay? So then, then you have this soldier, they're, they're just done training, they, they haven't gone and, and met the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or anyone, it's just been simulating and training. So now this soldier goes to their first unit to where they provide more training, more training for skills that the people there in that unit, they're like, okay, you know, we've been around for a while. You're going to need to learn this, that, and that before we send you to combat. Okay. Then they're going to issue you thousands of dollars of combat gear to use in training and combat. That's more investment. All that gear came from somewhere. It didn't come from thin air. And we're going to get to that. Then they send that soldier to combat. It costs money to send that soldier to combat, okay? They have to feed that soldier. They have to give that soldier a paycheck. Make sure their family is okay. If, they, if they're married and have kids, they, they have to take care of them too. Uh, while mommy or daddy is out at war uh, uh, serving the government. Making, making their money back on their investment. That's what the government is doing when they go to war, Okay? Government invests like a motherfucker in a building and creating a soldier. A lot of people do not understand this investment. Okay, there's some soldiers who don't even understand. A lot of the ones that's standing in the rear, just kind of like standing in the back, trying to do their time and get out. Like some of them might not even know or understand the intensity of this investment or the opportunities that they've been provided to train and learn new skills that they can go out and use. Very marketable skills that are that, that not everybody has. You don't learn these skills in high school and you don't learn them in college, okay? So the problem with this is if a soldier goes to war and they get a fucking scratch on them, depending on how big that scratch is or, or whatnot, the, the, then they just toss that soldier into the wind. Because what the army doesn't invest enough into, which they invest in the medicine, but what they don't invest enough into that, that you can actually physically see, there, there's, there's no, no data that any public knowledge that, that I can see that shows that they invest anything in a regeneration and recovery of injured soldiers to actually keep them in the fight. Okay, They invest enough to keep a person alive, stop them from bleeding, Keep them breathing after they've been torn from combat. Kick them out with medals that, that no one in the civilian world even understands what any of that means. They look at it. They might shake your hand and tell you thank you for your service. They don't know what any of that stuff means. They don't know what you did. If you try to explain it to them, there's so many so much lingo and slang and stuff and, and military jargon that they, they wouldn't even understand what you said. They would just get tired of it and, and, and they don't care. Okay? So now you have this soldier who got a scratch, uh, uh, an investment. This investment has has a scratch on it, and, and then the government's like, eh, let's let's just get rid of it, okay? And and why are they saying that? Because the doctor in the army, they're not real doctors. Some of them might have MDs before they got in. Some of them might even have malpractice cases before they got in and became doctors in the army. Okay, they might have credentials of a doctor, but they are not working to make you better. They're not working to have you recover. 
and keep you in the fight. They're working to find out once you get a big enough scratch and then kick your ass out of the army and, and then that's it. Okay? They they invest into making injured war veterans drug addicts. Okay? Giving them a bunch of pills to make them think that this injury or whatever is okay and that they can keep wearing body armor and keep wearing helmet and, and keep wearing gun and, and just let this scratch exist as long as they just keep feeding them pills. And, and that never enhances recovery and never enhances regeneration. It enhances deterioration. Deterioration of an investment. That soldier is an investment. Okay? The army does not try to fix these soldiers, okay? They they do they do enough to where again to, to send you on your way and keep you alive, but but it's not fixing the problem, okay? In some instances, it's understandable. There's sometimes something's too damaged, it's beyond repair. Okay, but there's some people who are repairable. Soldiers, soldiers, soldiers who have been invested in, okay? And if the army doesn't fix them up, they're, they're going to patch them up and send them on their way. Because the army knows they have new soldiers they're already investing in that are in basic training. And, and once they graduate basic training in AIT, they can just take your spot and replace you. That's such a stupid, stupid, stupid concept for the amount of money that you invest into a human being into developing. And not only that... Not every person can pass MEPS, all, all the genetics and your health history, your family's health history, all that stuff to get in the military. And then not everyone can pass basic training. So then the people who do and do pass all this training and they're alive after combat, they just, just like, oh, we'll just throw our investment in the trash can, okay? Let me give you a customer cost savings plan, big army. How about you learn how to regenerate and fix a soldier the best you can and retain the investment you have clearly spent a shit ton of money on? And I'm going to tell you why. Because if the army kicks this soldier out, and if, if, if this soldier, this veteran, this investment, the soldier who has skills that they cannot learn in formal institutes, can't learn it in college, can't learn it in high school, can't learn it in public schools, can't learn it in private schools. Walmart ain't going to teach you either. They can't learn it in formal institutes. They only learn it in the military. If this person gets out and if they discover medicine outside of what the military provides, that is a key term. If this torn veteran discovers medicine that is not provided and, and they don't have access to it because the military doesn't know anything about it, America doesn't know anything about it. If this person discovers something and gets better, they can get a return on the government's investment in them. If this soldier, this injured veteran goes to another country where stem cell injections are legal, which you don't go to the first care any of the clinics at home and get stem cell injections, there's a reason why. They don't want it here, okay? They go and get bioresonance using magnetic frequencies, nuclear medicine to heal your body, destroy disease and other aliens out. If a soldier or veteran goes outside of the U.S. and discovers medicine that is not provided by the military, it's not provided by the U.S. government, and they get better, and they're like, you know what, all these skills I got in the military, I can't go use them at Walmart, I can't use them at Dairy Queen, uh, I, anytime I interact with people because of the type of job that I do, people don't really understand that because this investment, they invested me to be a different type of human being than they are. And, and, and the investment the government put in me and the investment that these people are putting in themselves. But some people don't invest that much into themselves. These investments are, are, are counter-objecting each other, okay? So this investment, this soldier, this veteran can resort to doing what? Becoming a mercenary, a contractor, 
government contractors, what they usually call call them. Okay. If this mercenary decides that, hey, the United States doesn't pay that good, they don't offer that great of benefits for health benefits, retirement benefits, or anything else, but when I go online and type in my skills on, on Indeed and LinkedIn and all these other places, there, there's other governments in Dubai and other places that are offering me a lot of money, some of them tax-free, some of them are going to give me all sorts of benefits. I'll have prestige. I'll know other people in their government and, and, and other governments. And they can, whenever this contract's over, I can go to that contract and this contract. So what the U.S. government does is lose their investment. They lose their investment. That customer cost savings plan that I'm telling you about, if you invest into regenerating this soldier, regenerating them, and, and, and rebuilding this soldier, making sure that you have a place for them, make it that, that where these skills that they can't go use in, 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 in other places or whatever to where other people would have an advantage in their governments and military, you could just build that soldier back up and, and get keep getting your money back on your investment. Okay, you can keep getting money back on your investment if you just take care of that soldier the way that you promise them. Because there's a lot of children, 17, 18, 19 years old, raising their right hand, saying, yes, I, I, I will do what the government says. I will serve the military. I'll put this uniform on, and I will destroy the enemy of the United States if they tell me to. No questions asked. And, and they think at that moment when they got their right hand up and their, their family's taking their pictures and they're, they're about to leave MEPS and get on that, that plane to go to basic training, they think someone's going to take care of them in this fashion to where if I get a boo-boo in war, that, that my government's going to love me like mommy and, and grandma and they're going to take care of me. They're, they're, they're going to they're gonna fix my broken bones when I get broken bones. They're going to fix my scratches when I got scratches. They're going to fix my hair when I lose my hair. They're going to fix all these things. These are the, the, the concepts that a lot of people have when they join the military. And it's not true. It's not true. And the person who loses out the most outside of the soldier, the soldier is going to be the, the, the one that loses out the most. But outside of that soldier, that government is losing an investment. An investment they spend a lot of money in, okay? And and I'll tell you from a manufacturing perspective, someone who's worked as an engineer, someone who's worked as a mechanic, someone who's worked in higher technology who understands things that other people don't, who can, who can break mechanics and other things down visually w w without touching anything. There's not a lot of people who have these skills. When you get someone who has these skills and they go to these manufacturer sellouts where like a manufacturer is like, oh, we got too many broken machines, we can't fix them, or whatever. There's people who can fix these machines and rebuild them and make them operating productive machines if you get the right brains involved. I know this because I've been involved. I've gone to manufacturers to where the engineers and the mechanics, they're all good old boys. They're just people who hired their friends to do these jobs who weren't skilled. They, they didn't invest in themselves, invest in their knowledge, or invest in their ability to retain information. And, and they just told their buddy who hired them, like, yeah, we can't do anything with these machines. I don't know how to fix them. That's what doctors do in the military to soldiers. That's exactly what doctors do to military soldiers. That is what they do. They sit there and pretend to be a doctor because they're all whatever, good old boys or whatever. The commanders and everything will just listen to them. And then they kick them out, and then some other government or some other place decides to fix them, whether they're just like, hey, I'm going to use my disability money to go get stem cell injections in another country since they don't offer that here, they don't offer it to the VA, they don't offer there, I'll go to another country that offers bioresonance or all these other medicines that they don't offer, I'll just use what they're giving me, the resources, and then I'll go contract myself out to whoever's going to pay me more, Okay. The government could have retained that person and all these systems that they have in other countries to regenerate just normal everyday people that Hollywood actors, 
politicians, all, all these like people, high level prestige that you see on TV who are not soldiers, you know, they, they don't have the life of soldiers, they're not carrying like 75 pounds of stuff and, and, and hitting the ground and getting up or anything or whatever, and they know to go to these countries and invest themselves, but no one's investing in soldiers, these, these people who spent years, sometimes years just to get out of basic training in AIT if they're special forces soldiers, that might be two and a half years before you can actually use that person. And if they get out and get better and sell themselves to another country, they lose their investment here. And this is where sci-fi meets reality in my vision with Nova Jade. It might sound extreme. When you look in a lot of sci-fi movies, just like Back to the Future, when when we didn't think that teleconferencing like Zoom would ever happen, it was all fictitious. No one ever believed it. You you would have been called a clown or a fool or, or, or someone selling snake oil if you said that we were going to be able to FaceTime one day. No one ever would have believed it. A lot of people who probably won't believe that the body can regenerate a lot more than what you've been told in life. There's a lot of people who probably wouldn't believe that there was a time where I couldn't open this hand. That there was a time that I was in so much pain that, that I, I couldn't function or operate. And that, that people said I was just going to have to be like that. And, and I learned how to heal it. I, 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 topical cells. Topical applications. Whenever I started learning Egyptian medicine. I'm talking ancient Egyptian medicine. Also going through esoteric knowledge. Going through other forms of medicine and other places that have been practiced for thousands of years and seeing like, wow, these people knew that you could heal yourself. They are, they knew it years before I was ever born, years before the airplane ever existed, years before cars ever existed. People already knew this stuff, but they're not practicing it because they haven't sought out this knowledge. This knowledge isn't, isn't just given freely. I had to go seek out this knowledge. Okay, and, and there's other people like me who've cured diseases all around the world for, for the past 50 years who've been in instances where they might have had a boo-boo or a disease or something and, and because no, no one would help them or no one thought they could help them, they went out and learned. ...by the medical profession, one of the leading pharmaceutical houses working with the Miami Serpentarium and Director Haast has developed Cobroxin a highly purified extract of cobra venom, carefully measured in standard units for treatment of intractable pain. The pioneering work with cobra venom has already had dramatic success. This energetic young man, waving a greeting to his friend, Uncle Bill, was one of the first victims of polio to be successfully treated with cobra venom. The picture of health, this youngster was stricken with polio at the age of two and a half. Paralysis was already spreading to the child's legs when cobra venom was administered. Recovery was quick and complete. They learned, they discovered, and they found out things that other people did not believe would ever be truthful, such as electricity, the light bulb, the TV, the doorknob. Things that people never thought would be true became true. And I feel like if I continue to show examples, examples in my own body as well as others who, who support my cause to prove that yes, your body, when introduced to the right environment, and when the right resources, the right resources, medicine and the technology are applied, then the healing properties that your body already has and already produces can be amplified. And if they can be amplified, then a soldier, the investment on them, can now be returned. Soldiers who have adapted and accustomed to a lifestyle to where they're only familiar and accepted as a soldier, they can continue on that lifestyle. Something that they love to do. Something that they honor. Better than leaving them thinking, oh, 
I raised my right hand and I thought people were going to take care of me, but they didn't invest into learning how. Okay, there, were, there was a time frame when soldiers didn't know how to stop bleeding. And then we entered the Iraq war and the Iraq war taught the army, oh yeah, you haven't been teaching all your soldiers how to use tourniquets. Y'all never believed this would be something that y'all needed to do. Now the war is teaching you that yes, you need to teach all your soldiers how to use tourniquets to prevent their buddies and themselves from bleeding out to death. And, and that was implemented and it was a success. And, and I think all civilians should learn it too. And there's a time where people are going to look back and they're going to be like, man, there were all these soldiers in the Iraq and the Afghanistan war, Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom, who learned a whole lot during their training. They learned a whole lot during their individual experiences. And some of them are getting better and they are going out and becoming contractors and mercenaries and their allegiance is now signed over to other countries who are not the United States government. Now I love my country And I love the soldiers, Marines, air, airmen, sailors, Coast Guard, everybody in the military, their cause. To do something selfless, outside of themselves, outside of what their families and anyone else want. And they deserve you to further invest into their rehabilitation, their recovery, and their regeneration. So you and them can both maximize your investment returns. Because there's no other place in the world that needs these people's skills the most other than a government and a military. And if you're willing to just toss them in the wind because the doctor who doesn't know more than what they were taught is telling you they can't be fixed. Guess what? There's someone out there that, that's going to fix them. If they can't figure it out, they'll just pay somebody else to fix them for themselves since, again, there's a lot of restrictive medicine and things of that nature, but when it comes to the military, there's a lot of things that they don't restrict. They don't restrict everybody from holding a gun or a rifle. So why restrict medicine in the same way that they're restricting everybody else in the civilian world to just aliopathic, which aliopathic medicine is the most infant medicine form that exists. It's the newest form. It's the, it's the most newly discovered. And if you look at the World Health Organization, if you look at the CDC, look at their statistics. Aliopathic medicine is usually on the top three killers, which means doctors are on a top list of things that kill people, along with ty uh, diabetes type 2, heart attacks, cardiac disease, and allopathic medicine or misdiagnosis, ODs medicine, things that think things that, that make you a drug addict and, and, and vegetated where you're not getting better. Okay. There's technology and there's science that exists to stop this. And I'm going to develop it. I'm going to do everything that I can. I'm going to develop it. I'm going to give soldiers a second chance. I'm going to end up going to the AUSA convention once I have this technology develop and I'm going to present it. I'm going to present it to the United States Army at a AUSA convention tour. I'm a, I'm a lifetime member to these events. I used to go to these events. If you don't know what AUSA is, that's the Association of the United States Army. If there's anything that's prototype sci-fi, that sci-fi turning into reality, this is a place where they go sell it to the military at. It's a, it's a big old exhibition trade show. Okay, any any defense contractor name that you've ever thought of, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, uh, Raytheon, any of the names that you can go on the New York Stock Exchange and their defense sector and look up, 
they, they go to these conventions. Everybody in Washington, D.C. knows. Okay? And at these conventions, this is where sci-fi can become reality. There will be a reality when soldiers get to regenerate. They get to heal. They get, they get to do the things they love and, and no longer get kicked out for scratches and boo-boos anymore. And whenever that happens, they're going to thank Nova J for it because Nova J is going to make it happen. I promise you that. <laughs>